are the women we've come to drum. We are the channel between the earth and the sun. We hold the wisdom of the ancient ways. We will bring peace to these troubled days. Welcome to Visionary Vegan Woman. I'm your host, Kate Fallo, and I created this exciting event designed to empower women to step into their highest spiritual destinies, embody their feminine power, and answer the call of their souls when it comes to helping the animals and the earth. This powerful paradigm shifting conversation will inspire us to be unstoppable in the face of fear and steadfast in holding the vision of the future we so desire to see manifest. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here with me today. I'm so, I so appreciate you showing up for yourself, for the animals, for our beautiful mother earth. And I know you're going to be happy you tuned in today because it's a special day and it is my honor and great pleasure to be interviewing a woman who is truly living her sacred purpose. She is the founder and president of a beautiful organization called Beyond Carnism, which I believe is a social justice movement of its own right. And I can't wait for all of you to hear more about it. Um, this amazing woman's name is Dr. Melanie Joy. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for that very warm introduction. <laughs> thank you for being with us. So Dr. Melanie Joy is a Harvard-educated psychologist, international speaker, organizational consultant, and relationship coach. She's also the author of five books, the award-winning Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, Beyond Beliefs, A Guide to Improving Relationships and Communication for Vegans, Vegetarians, and Meat Eaters, Powerarchy, Understanding the Psychology of Oppression for Social Transformation, Getting Relationships Right, and Strategic Actions for Animals. Dr. Joy has developed and implemented advocacy trainings for over a decade, and she specializes in strategic vegan advocacy, effective communication, organizational dynamics and leadership, healthy relationships, the psychology of social transformation, and, sus and sustainability. Dr. Joy is the eighth recipient of the, the Ahimsa Award, previously given to the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela, for her work on global nonviolence, as well as the Empty Cages Prize, previous, previously given to Tom Reagan, for her contribution to furthering the cause of animal rights, and the Peter Singer Prize for strategies to reduce the suffering of animals. She is the founding president of Beyond Carnism and a co-founder of Pro Veg International. Wow, amazing, amazing work you're doing. Thank you. So your topic today is developing healthy ways of relating for a better world for all beings. And I love this topic. I think it's so important. So let's, let's just get right into it. So your work focuses on both raising awareness of carnism, of the ideology and mentality of eating animals, and on healthy relationality. And I, I'm curious to know what led you to do this particular work. Well, um, it grew out of my own life experience and, um, you know, like most probably all work does. Um, when I was a child, um, we had a dog. I grew up with a dog like many people do in many places in the world who I, I loved like a family member. Um, and I was also a person who always, even when I was a child, really cared about the well-being of other animals um, and really cared about justice in general. Um, and, you know, would never want to know that I was participating in violence against other animals or, or other humans. And, you know, of course, I also grew up eating animals, eating meat, eggs and dairy. And um, it was just, you know, it was interesting now or it is interesting now for me to look back on how, you know, over the course of so many meals and so many years, I never thought about how strange it was that I could pet my dog with one hand while I ate like a pork chop with the other, you know, a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as, as intelligent and sensitive as my dog. Um, so what happened to me was that when I was 23 years old in 1989, I ate a hamburger that was contaminated with um, Campylobacter. I got incredibly sick. I was hospitalized on IV antibiotics. 
And after that experience, I just stopped eating meat. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I stopped eating dairy as well. But I, I stopped eating meat and eggs immediately. Um, not because of any conscious ethical decision at the time, but just because I was disgusted by the last food that I had eaten that had made me so sick, which very often happens to people. Um, so I was, um, you know, curious, I had to learn about my new diet, which at the time was vegetarian. And as I was learning about vegetarianism, I of course stumbled upon information about animal agriculture and what I learned shocked and horrified me. Um, I just, I could not believe the extent of the suffering of, you know, billions and billions of non-human beings. Um, I couldn't believe what was happening to the environment. Um, and then later on, this was back in the eighties and there wasn't a lot of health consciousness. You know, later on, I realized that I, you know, had also been contributing to damage to my own body, um, through eating animal products. So I was just shocked and horrified. Um, what shocked me perhaps even more was that nobody I talked to about what I learned was willing to hear what I had to say. They would always be like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. Or they'd create, call me a crazy vegetarian propagandist. And so this really was what triggered me to become very curious as to, you know, what was going on in the psychology of myself and other people who, like myself, were rational, compassionate people who nevertheless refused to hear, I mean, or were unwilling to see what was right in front of us. Um, and so I studied the psychology of violence and nonviolence, and I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating animals. Um, and this was really what got the whole ball rolling for me. Wow, that's amazing. So, yeah, I mean, yes, this 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 denial and this resistance towards, you know, what is going on around us, and and I too, like you, like you know, we're compassionate beings, and when I wasn't vegan. I also had this resistance, you know, because of cultural conditioning, I had this resistance towards, you know, really seeking the truth and going beyond the veil and like, you know, pushing aside the curtains and seeing what's really going on there. So um, do you want to expand a little bit on carnism and, and touch on how it influences both non-vegans and vegans? Yeah. Um, so what I what I discovered through my research is that there's an invisible um, belief system uh, that I named carnism. Uh, and this carnism is essentially the opposite of veganism. Um, you know, we often assume that it's only vegans and vegetarians who follow a belief system. Um, but, you know, most of us learn to eat pigs, but not dogs, for example, because we do learn to follow a belief system. We do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not uh, a necessity, which is true for many, though not all people, but many people in the world today, then it's a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. But carnism is not just a belief system, it's an invisible belief system. Um, and it's a, what's called a dominant belief system. That means that it is not only invisible, but it is woven through the very structure of society. It's institutionalized, it's embraced and maintained by all of the major social institutions, you know, from you know, nutrition, medicine, business, government, the family. Um, and it's woven through the very structure of society to shape norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. So for example, when we study nutrition, we're actually studying carnistic nutrition. But because carnism is invisible, we don't recognize this bias that's all around us. And carnism is also a violent ideology. Meat cannot be procured without killing, and egg and dairy production cause extensive harm to animals. Yet most people care about animals. And I mean, even if they're not, quote, animal lovers, most people would never want to cause other animals to suffer unnecessarily. Um, and so carnism needs to use a set of psychological defense mechanisms that distort our perceptions and disconnect us from our natural empathy so that we act against our values of, of compassion and of justice, which is fairness, without realizing what we're doing. It essentially, the system essentially teaches us how not to think and feel. So for example, um, you know, if you just imagine, you know, imagine that you're not vegan and you are eating a hamburger 
and um, you're enjoying your hamburger and then somebody tells you, oh, by the way, that's not a hamburger from cows, that's a hamburger from golden retrievers. You know, chances are your reaction would be very different. Even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed, your thoughts and feelings about the meat would change dramatically because you haven't been conditioned by carnism to disconnect from the truth of your experience when it comes to eating animals. You look at when, when we, um, one defense mechanism is called, that I'll, I'll give you as an example, is um, the name is not that important, but de-individualization. Carnism teaches us to look at farmed animals, these animals we've learned to classify as edible, as lacking any individuality or any personality of their own. So we learn to think, for example, that a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. So if you're eating a piece of bacon, you're not thinking that this was someone, you're not thinking about this individual, you're seeing that as a piece of food. Whereas, again, if you were told that piece of bacon was from a dog, you would immediately feel disgusted probably and really think about the individual whose life um, had been taken. I just love this concept and it's like, it's like, whoa, yes, like, why aren't we, why don't we know this? I love that you bring this to light because it's just, once we know, it's so obvious what's happening here in our society. And, and it also helps, like, it helped me realize, like, why I disconnected from my truth, you know, for so many years and, like, how we're all vulnerable to it. And, and it also helped me realize like why I had such a spiritual awakening when I did go vegan, because I was like reconnecting to the truth of who I am. Um, and just going, you know, shifting that paradigm of like what I, how I grew up and what I was conditioned to believe. And it just, I mean, I just was like able to finally really listen into my heart versus what, you know, the dominant culture was telling me. And, Yes, carnism. I, I love that you coined this word. I love that there's a word for it now so that, you know, it can't remain invisible anymore. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And um, so, so why do you say healthy ways of relating are important for creating a better world for all beings? Well, when you think about it, um, all uh, when, when we look at the problems in the world, when we look at problems of oppression, for example, humans oppressing non-humans. You know, oppression is essentially abuse of, an abuse of power, institutional um, abuse of power. We look at abuse. When we look at the major problems, uh, the major suffering, or at least human-caused suffering, which is you know, a lot of suffering in the world today, we can see that this suffering results from the way that we relate. So we can see, for example, the way that we relate to farmed animals is it is dysfunctional. In other words, it creates problems rather than um, it, it, it reflects a dysfunction in how we relate. It doesn't create connection. It creates disconnection. When we look at the world, um, when we look at oppression very often, you know, we think people have different oppressions that they're particularly, you know, perhaps focused on oppression of women, oppression of farmed animals, oppression of all animals, perhaps um, oppression of spe specific uh, human groups. All of these forms of oppression reflect a dysfunction in the way we relate. A dysfunction in the way we relate as social groups to one another, um, as humans to non-human animals. We can see um, a dysfunction in the way we relate to the environment. When we relate to the environment in a way that causes harm, you know, rather than helps, rather than is nurturing. Um, the major problems that we see in our lives and our world are problems that reflect dysfunction in the way we relate. We can see this again in, in problematic relationships, interpersonal dysfunction, you know, or even in how we relate to ourselves. So when we look at oppression, we tend to look at oppression through the lens of politics, you know, through the lens of sociology, through the lens of economics. This is important. You know, we need to look through these lenses. We also need to look through the lens of psychology at the mentality that drives these oppressive behaviors. And even more specifically, we need to look at the lens, look through the lens of relationships. When we see, uh, you know, healthy relationality or healthy relation relationships are relationships where we practice integrity. That means that we um, practice our values of caring or compassion, 
and justice or fairness toward another or toward ourselves when we're relating to ourselves. We know, or research at least has shown, that um, compassion and justice are universal human values. They're espoused by humans across cultures. So we all carry these, or the vast majority of us hold these values. Um, when we relate in a way that's healthy, we practice these core values. That is the practice of integrity. And in so doing, what we're doing is we're honoring the other's dignity. We are saying, you matter to me. I, I recognize your fundamental worth. You matter. So when we relate in a way that's healthy, we practice integrity, we honor dignity. And that leads to greater connection between us and a sense of empowerment. And I know you, you can understand what I'm saying because we've all lived this. We know exactly what this feels like. So healthy relationships look the same, no matter who we're relating to, whether we're relating on a collective level and we're talking about creating a healthier society or whether we're relating on an interpersonal level to our partner, to the cashier at the grocery store, or whether we're relating to ourselves, whether we're relating to other animals, whether we're relating to the environment, we can create greater connection, in particular meaningful connection or disconnection. We can cause harm you know, or wellness. So it's very important for us to, um, especially those of us who are already committed to creating healthier lives in a healthier world, to really step back and look at the way we relate on a minute to minute basis so that we um, don't end up becoming the very thing we're trying to transform. I mean, you, I think you know what I'm talking about. We can see movements for compassion and justice with proponents in those movements that are acting in ways that are not kind and not just. You know, we berate people who disagree with us or, you know, in the vegan movement, we, you know, many vegans, of course, not all vegans, but vegans, you know, will uh, berate other vegans for not being vegan enough or perfectly vegan all the time. This, this non-relational mentality is so pervasive that even as we're working toward a more relational and healthy world, we almost automatically start acting in ways that are non-relational and problematic. And the problem with this is we start recreating the very problem that we're working to transform, bringing that same kind of attitude and energy and, and behavior to it. Yeah, wow. This is such a strong point to bring up. I mean, I've, I've been having growing awareness around this, especially because I have three younger children. So lots of triggers happen. And I have a husband who is not, you know, he's not, he doesn't label himself. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <laughs> doesn't subscribe to labels, vegan or non-vegan. But um, so, you know, it's, it comes up, relationships come up. And I feel like, you know, didn't Mother Teresa say like, peace begins within the home, like within, you know, the first place you can begin bringing peace is like, in your family and in your relationships and your close relationships. And I think that this is so important. And I actually wanted to bring, um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about Beyond Beliefs, your book, because it really was helpful for me um, in, you know, just really kind of starting to align my, my values in my relationships, like you were talking about, um, with what I truly, truly believe in. So um, yeah, did you wanna kind of talk about Beyond Beliefs, which is called Beyond Beliefs, a guide to improving relationships and communication among vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters? Sure, I mean, and, and what you say is really valuable where we, um, you know, practicing peace in our own home is so important because, um, I mean, practicing peace or practicing healthy relationality, however you want to put it, our, our relationships can be and often are a training ground, you know, where we can cultivate healthier selves, more sustainable, healthier, more resilient selves so that we so that we bring more of the kind of qualities into the world that we want to see in the world. Peace doesn't necessarily have to begin in the home. It's, it's useful. I mean, we want to have it in the home. Peace can begin anywhere, you know, and, and peace needs to be worked toward on a, on a broader level as well, which I know you're well aware of, obviously. Um, so 
it's, I think it's very important to look at these different, the different levels and layers of relationality that um, are, are important to address so that we don't feel like, you know, there's, I, I wrote about this in Beyond Beliefs, we have this idea, you weren't speaking to this, but, but I think it's worth naming. Many of us learn to believe that if we don't love ourselves, we can't love another, you know, and we believe this, but I don't know that there's any research that actually supports it. I think it was an idea that somebody came up with that's based in some useful uh, information, but it's not necessarily true. We can learn to love ourselves through learning another sometimes. You know, you have a baby, for instance, and, and for some people, that's the first time they start practicing love toward another. Um, and so in Beyond Beliefs, I really, I wrote Beyond Beliefs because I, I started moving from talking about carnism and ideology to talking about relationships for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one reason is because carnism is one type of oppression. It's not, you know, we could transform carnism and that doesn't necessarily mean we will transform the problems in the world. You know, the Veganism is not the solution to the world's problems. However, no solution that does not include veganism is complete. But carnism is a piece of a whole. It's helpful to think of these isms, these problematic isms as like spokes on a wheel. And the hub is non-relationality, essentially. So I started to look like a bit deeper than carnism. And, and that's what my new book, Powerarchy, is about. It's about this system, this mentality that is non-relational, that that's like the meta system of oppression. I also wrote Beyond Beliefs because um, as you point out, um, so many people would become vegan and tell me, thousands of vegans around the world, that becoming vegan was like one of the most empowering, sometimes the most empowering choices they could make in their lives. And yet their sense of empowerment and inspiration quickly turns to shock and horror when they discovered that their friends and family, their relationships and communication were breaking down. And so, and this is, this is a, an incredible struggle that many vegans have. Now you don't have to have relationship and communication breakdown because you become vegan, but most of us don't have the tools. We haven't learned the tools to navigate relational dynamics in a healthy way. And then when you throw this added layer of veganism on, um, it can become very complicated for people. And so I, I realized there was a lot of suffering among vegans who are people who are really doing incredibly important work, in my opinion, trying to make the world a better place for animals. Um, and who found that, you know, many vegans will say, all I have to do is open my mouth and say, I'm vegan. And suddenly I get like hit with this wall of resistance to something that I'm not even trying to push against. You know, people would tell me all the reasons why veganism is wrong when they never even knew what veganism was until I told them I was vegan. So I really wanted to provide people, vegans and vegetarians as well, because a lot of vegetarians have told me that they have the same problems in their relationships and also with non-vegans with the principles and tools for, for healthy relationships, cultivating healthy relationships, and specifically navigating this ideological veg, non-veg difference in their relationships. Yes, it was so, it's such a great book and I recommend it, I highly recommend it for anyone, just for anyone, <laughs> really. It's, relationships are everywhere, it's our life. So you're gonna encounter that. And I, I just wanted to quote you here in your book, in Beyond Beliefs, because this was a really helpful quote for me um, and concept, which is you talk about how arguments are really deep down inside. They're really about being feeling witnessed and feeling safe. And um, I just want to read it, what, what you write. Arguments are actually a reaction to disconnection, disconnection and an attempt at reconnection. Underneath the content of the arguments are often the questions, can I count on you? Will you respond to me when I call? Do I matter to you? Can I feel safe with you? Um, I have goosebumps with that. I just, it's just so important to realize that, you know, even though we may, you know, fight over, if I may, might fight over, you know, not feeling like I want to hear about, you know, someone's carnivorous meal or something like that, or I feel offended by someone's behavior or at the end of the day, at the root of this is this feeling that I don't feel safe, that I, 
that I don't matter. And um, yeah, that was just, it's just so helpful. It puts things into perspective and it really, it helps you not dwell on like the surface of the situation and helps you kind of just really look into yourself and really see what you can do to make yourself feel safe or help yourself, you know, or, or try to reconnect with that person at a deeper level versus just keeping on going on with the, well, you ate chicken and you know, that doesn't work for me, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, well, I'm glad that that was useful for you. And of course, I mean, arguments can exist for a lot of different reasons. Um, but in my book, I talk particularly about how often, as you point out, underneath an argument is a search for connection and, you know, and, and a search for safety and a feeling of not being witnessed or not being seen. And, and we see this a lot in veg, non-veg relationships, you know, or, or in relationships wherever there, whenever there's a difference and particularly a, a significant difference, but differences in general can kick up the, these kinds of arguments where we end up getting stuck in the content of the discussion you know the content is what we're talking about and we lose sight of the process and the process is how we're communicating essentially how we're relating and the process just the process matters more and so it's you know under it can be helpful to remember that underneath this difference between veg non-veg or you know whatever the difference may be even between two vegans who are having a difference of opinion about something underneath this difference is a relationship between people. And that's where the focus of the conversation needs to be first. Yes, exactly. And on the heels of this, did you wanna, you talk about in the book, you talk about compassionate witnessing. Can you talk a little bit about, more about this concept or, um, and just, I, I think it's just so helpful for us to be able to have like tools and practices just like on hand <laughs> available to us right away. <laughs> um, Compassionate witnessing is a, a phrase that was coined by a psychologist named Kathy Weingarten um, in a book called Common Shock, actually. And it's essentially paying attention. It's listening, you know, paying attention to another or to yourself. You can compassionately witness yourself, too. Um, but paying attention with compassion and empathy and to the best of your ability without judgment. Um, and I say to the best of your ability because we are you know, we all have egos and it's really hard not to judge, you know? Um, so I don't want to encourage any kind of perfectionism, um, but just, you know, when, when very often what happens to vegans in relationships with non-vegans, because carnism is the dominant ideology or the dominant um, belief system, this sets up a dynamic, an automatic dynamic between the non-vegan and the vegan, whereby the non-vegans needs and perceptions and opinions, um, beliefs are automatically given more weight than the vegans. So many vegans, it's just the way that this is just the way social systems operate. You know, when you are born into or when you are a member of a dominant social group, that means a social group that has more social power, where your beliefs are, you know, supported by the dominant institutions. You're part of the norm, you know, the mainstream. You are immediately in a position of more power in a relationship, whether you want it or not, whether you realize it or not. And so what this means for vegans is that many vegans find that their opinions are taken less seriously, that their needs are taken less seriously, that their experiences are taken less seriously. And so for example, a, a vegan uh, sitting at the dinner table and with, with animals on the table, dead animals on the table is um, very often that is an incredibly distressing experience for the vegan. And yet, the people who are not vegan around them uh, tend to, very often anyway, will tend to minimize that and say, oh, get over it. You know, you weren't always vegan. This didn't bother you six months ago. What's wrong now? Um, and the vegan will have to work very, very hard simply so that their experience is even slightly witnessed. And often that doesn't work at all because carnism is organized, as I said earlier, around these psychological defense mechanisms. So people, most people do not realize that um, they become automatically defensive against hearing any challenges to their carnism. And the vegan represents a direct challenge to their carnism. 
So it, it's very tricky. And one of the things that I talk about in my book, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about two things right now. One is the need for vegans to actually feel compassionately witnessed because they're not witnessed by the world at large. You know, we go through like we, we live in a very different world than non-vegans do in many ways. You know, we walk out the door and, and it's like daily, our deepest sensibilities are offended. We see trucks driving by, you know, meat trucks. We see trucks of body parts. We walk past billboards of like smiling people putting dead animals into their mouths as though nothing were wrong. And when we even try to express or share our sadness, our grief, our outrage, we're told we're hysterical, we're overly emotional, sentimental animal lovers. Um, you know, many vegans are active in trying to clean up the mess that's made by others. They're never thanked for their efforts and, and end up being mocked on top of that. So we are so not witnessed by the dominant culture and so not seen and understood that we need it in some ways even more in our own family systems, you know, with the people who are closest to us because we just don't get it um, enough. And yet we often don't get that from our friends and family either. And so in Beyond Beliefs, I actually have scripts, um, you know, these appendices that you can just photocopy and share with the people in your life or reword them so that they're own, your own words to help other people understand what your experience is like so you actually feel seen. It's impossible to actually have an, any real authentic connection with somebody if they don't understand your inner world. And so many vegans feel like they have to shrink themselves to fit into their relationships and hide what they're most proud of and hide what they're most afraid of and hurt by. And that just doesn't work for anybody in the long run. It's just that when vegans start trying to share what they know, they end up being told, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal, like I had been told. And so there are ways around this. You know, there are ways to ask for witnessing instead of trying to, you know, focus on the content. You need to know what's happening to the animals, you know, or what's happening to your body. And instead of trying to focus on or instead of trying to change the people in your life to make them more vegan, you can simply say, I really, really would appreciate being able to share information about veganism with you, not to change your mind, not to convert you, but so you understand me. This is so fundamental to who I am. If you don't understand veganism, you can't see me in this fundamental part of my life. And so it's an invitation to share who you are rather than an attempt to advocate to the people in your life. And often that conversation can shift the dynamic tremendously. That's so beautiful and so powerful. And oh, thank you for putting words to exactly how I felt. And I just didn't know what was happening for so long. And then when I came across your book, I was like, wow, this is, here's a solution. And yeah, it, I mean, it just brings it back to like, if we just fight over the content, it just brings it back to creating what we don't want in the world and versus, you know, bringing it down to yourself and, and what you, you're tr truly seeking for yourself and, and, you know, kind of like, um, I guess giving them the tools to support you, you know, cause they don't have them currently. So thank you for that. It's a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful just way of relating that is <laughs> very foreign for most of us, but, um, and, and thank you for putting words to, to how so many of us feel and don't know why, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's great. So go out and get beyond beliefs, women. <laughs> it's just so helpful. Um, so if you had one prayer that would make this world a better place, what would that be? Hmm. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I, I really, yeah, I mean, I really do believe that um, because I believe so strongly that dysfunctional ways of relating, you know, to others and to ourselves are at the core of so many of the violent behaviors and oppressive systems in the world. I also believe that developing relational literacy 
which is an understanding of healthy relationships, relational dynamics, and the ability to practice those is really essential, essential to transformation. And it's transformation on the personal level and transformation on the social level as well. We can't, I really believe that we will never be able to create the world we want unless we change the way we relate. And I'm not saying it has to just be work on yourself and everything will be fine. Um, I am suggesting that we work on ourselves, that we work towards change from the inside out as well as from the outside in. And as we create healthier and more sustainable relationships and lives, we're better positioned to work on changing the world as well. Um, my, my book, Getting Relationships Right, which is coming out in um, January, is it's like beyond beliefs, but for everyone. So it's a lot of the same principles and tools with some additions um, from beyond beliefs, but it's applied outside of veg, non-veg dynamics. So, and the goal is to raise the level of relational literacy um, among people. Amazing. I can't wait for that book. <laughs> so I guess in conclusion, I'd love to ask you what I've been asking all of our speakers, which is what does it mean to you to be a visionary vegan woman? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I don't, it's interesting. I, I, my work is largely in the vegan space. Um, and there were, that's because I think that's where I'm able to do the best work, meaning I'm able to have the kind of, um, I'm able to, to do the most that I can in the short life that I have. I'm able to affect the largest number of individuals in a way that I think matters a lot. Um, and that said, being vegan is one part of a much bigger whole of who I am. I'm much more than vegan and I don't even really think of myself as vegan. I mean, even though I live a vegan lifestyle. Um, so what it means to me to be a visionary, a vegan visionary is a, is a person who has, I mean, we're all visionaries in different ways. Right. And for me, it's holding a vision of what, uh, holding a vision of a more relational world and, doing everything that I can to help bring that vision to fruition, you know, to, to provide information for people and, and tools, you know, really practical tools for people who, who would like to share that vision. And there are a lot of people out there who also want a more relational, more compassionate world. Yes. And I, I would say you're doing that job beautifully, Melanie. Thank so you. thank you so much for being with us and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. And um, yeah, I just, I wish you a beautiful day. I wish our listeners a beautiful day. And thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.